Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rev Left Radio. On today's episode, I have on Thomas Riggins to discuss his newest book, um, which was actually published by the comrades over at Midwestern Marx, entitled Reading the Classical Texts of Marxism. And in this text, he really takes four major works, one by Engels, anti during three by Lenin, um, materialism and imperial criticism, state and revolution, and left-wing communism and infantile disorder, and really goes through these four texts in depth, um, exploring these concepts, uh, writing multiple essays per text, and really just bringing these texts to life, showing their relevance, you know, dis- uh, arguing over certain mischaracterizations and misunderstandings of these texts. And, and just a really interesting work that I really recommend for anybody out there who considers themselves a Marxist. Um, again, uh, Carlos from Midwestern Marx was the one that set this up. So I want to give a shout out to uh, Comrade Carlos for, for making this episode happen. I really appreciate it. Um, and I also wanted to say, as I, I think I say in this in this episode somewhere, but um, we cover those four texts. And of course, over at Red Menace, our sister podcast, where we where we tackle these these theoretical texts uh, in the Marxist tradition. We've done episodes on left-wing communism and infantile disorder and state and revolution by Lenin. So after you listen to us discuss those texts and you want to go uh, learn more about them, you can hop right over to Red Menace and uh, hear those episodes if you haven't already. Or, of course, you can buy this this book, which I'll link to in the show notes, and you can go through those texts at even deeper levels at e- with even more detail. Um, so this is a fascinating, wide-ranging conversation, definitely coming from a Marxist-Leninist perspective, 100%, which I appreciate. Um, so here is my interview with Thomas Riggins on his newest book, Reading the Classical Texts of Marxism. Enjoy. My name is Thomas Riggins, and uh, I'm here to discuss a new book I just uh, had published for me by the uh, Midwestern Marxist Institute called Reading the Classical Texts of Marxism, which is their title. I I didn't have a title for it, so that sounds like a good title. Wonderful. Yes, it is a good title, and it is a wonderful text. So shout out to uh, Midwestern Marx, who set this that organization kind of set up this interview and obviously published this text. And so let's go ahead and, and just dive into it. I guess the best way to start and help our listeners orient themselves to to you and your work, can you just kind of tell us about your career in philosophy, how you got interested in it, and then how you came to embrace Marxism and Leninism? Well, to make a long story short, I got interested in philosophy way back when I was a teeny bopper and grew up in the South, and I had a friend in high school. Everybody was religious and going to church and believing in religion, and he said I should read a book by Bertrand Russell entitled Why I'm Not a Christian. I read that book, and I said, oh, my gosh, there are adults (laughs) that don't (laughs) believe in Jesus. I can't believe it. (laughs) And so uh, that got me interested in reading Russell, and then I read a book a great book that if people aren't haven't read philosophy they they should read the story of philosophy by uh, will durant which is a very popular exposition starting back with aristotle and plato and going right up to uh, the the 20th century so that's how i got interested in philosophy i also interested in anthropology though like after i read russell i read uh, some uh books on the evolution of man, uh, saw Neanderthals and what we now call Homo erectus, but in those days was called Physicanthropus. Uh, I said, oh, Jesus, this, <laughs> I hate to say that, <laughs> but uh, this whole story that I was brought up on seems to be contradicted by science. Uh, I went off to Florida State University. I won a, a, a scholarship and I uh, I majored in anthropology and archaeology and minored in philosophy, but switched over to philosophy for a master's degree uh, there and later for a Ph.D. at the uh, CUNY, that is the City University of New York Graduate School. So that's how I got interested in philosophy, how I got interested in Marxism at Florida State University. uh, I met some people who were graduating who were in YPSL, which is the Young People's Socialist League. 
I met them at a just by accident. I was a freshman. They they were leaving as seniors. They found out that I was not interested in joining a fraternity, and so they said, "Well, listen, why don't you take over this <laughs> Young People Socialist League?" So they gave me the little paraphernalia of, of what the Young People Socialist League was, and it was, I was the only one. But I met some other people who were friends of mine, as and so we made a little chapter of five of us, and and we uh, ran ran that uh, little league down at Florida State University. It wasn't actually recognized by the state by the state university because it was socialist. <laughs> and the Young People Socialist League was the youth section of the Socialist Party USA, and the leader of that at that time was Norman Thomas. So we mutated, I had mutated into a communist by reading Marx and Engels. And we, we weren't really in contact with the national Ypsil because they were up in the north and we were down in Tallahassee. And we just figured out we should support everybody who called themselves a Marxist-Leninist. Hmm. And therefore we ended up supporting the Soviet Union, North Korea, the Vietnamese, Cuba. Uh, we didn't know at the time that all of those uh, states were anathema to the Socialist Party because they were they were communists and they had a position of the third way in between capitalism and communism. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, but when we read their literature, we found that when push came to shove, the Socialist Party always sided with the capitalists over the over the communists. So. When I got to New York, I joined, uh, years later, I got to New York, and uh, I read the communist newspaper, and I called them up on the telephone, and they sent somebody over to interview me, and I joined the Communist Party back around 1972. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I also came out of philosophy as, a, as an undergraduate. That's all I have is an undergraduate degree in philosophy, and uh, obviously every young philosopher, at least in the Anglo world, comes across Bertrand Russell, and I was sort of interested in him to some extent early on. Um, and I remember reading the, the history of Western philosophy by Bertrand Russell, and uh, as my Marxism grew, really came to hate his chapter on Marx. <laughs> um, I don't know if you remember that that text in, in particular, but Bertrand uh, Russell was— that text. I use that text for at least 20 years teaching introductory philosophy to people just because it's so readable. True, true, yes. I, I had two chapters. Well, there are more than two chapters. The chapter I hated was the Hegel chapter. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> The Marx is derivative from the Hegel chapter. True. He saw oh, Marx as uh, getting his ideas from Hegel. Mm -hmm. I also didn't like what he said about Rousseau mm. or Spinoza. Interesting. I mean, he loved Spinoza, but he thought, well, you know, he can't have his philosophy. But, but Spinoza is also the grandfa great grandfather. Spinoza leads to Hegel. Hegel leads to Feuerbach. Feuerbach leads to Marx. Mm -hmm. Marx leads to Lenin. And Lenin leads to. Reading the classical texts of Marxism. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not sure that last step will be recognized by. <laughs> but I like it. That's hilarious. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Rousseau and, and Spinoza for sure. And, and we've done episodes on Spinoza for those interested. I would like to do more episodes on Rousseau, but I'd have to go back and revisit that text to see what he got wrong about them. It's been quite a while. But let's go ahead and just move on and get into this text um, itself, the text that we're talking about. Um, and can you just kind of talk about this book, how you came to work with Midwestern Marx to get it published, and kind of what your main goals of, of, this, uh, of this text are? Well, this, these, this text grew out of the fact that back in the beginning of the century, I volunteered to work down at the Communist Party headquarters. And my assignment was to help out with their theoretical journal, Political Affairs, which they have since, since liquidated. But at that time, I became an associate editor, assistant editor, associate editor. And I wrote all of the articles, all of the chapters in this book were originally articles that I published either in political affairs or on the blog that the writers were given a blog. And I either put them on my blog 
or in the magazine Political Affairs over over about a 15 year period. And uh, I can't quite remember how I got into contact with the Midwestern Marxists. I think a friend of mine uh, knew Carlos, who is uh, one of the leaders there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he introduced, told me that I should contact them. And I contacted them and we had a discussion. And I started to submit some articles to Midwestern Marx. And I figured, you know what, these articles, since political affairs had been liquidated, and I thought all of my articles now were orphans, I would just see if they would be interested in republishing them. So I sent them in one at a time over a period of a couple of years. And they appeared on the website. You've seen their website, right? Oh, yeah. they on, in the articles thing. Mm -hmm. and they liked them, which surprised me very much. I mean, they liked them very much. And it was their suggestion that they collect them together and publish this book, which, of course, I had no objections to at all. Sure. So that's how the uh, book came into existence. I up. Dated. I had to like change things from Bush to Obama and then from Obama to Trump. <laughs> Since the system remains pretty much dysfunctionally the same, it doesn't change very much by changing who the president was. Absolutely. Um, and the, the, the text itself, uh, reading the classical text of Marxism, this sort of collection of your of your essays that are, have been updated and revised but have been written over the years, uh, it really focuses on the works of, of Engels and Lenin in particular. Why did um, you decide to put together your essays specifically on Engels and Lenin? It was just my own curiosity. I said to myself, having read many commentaries and stuff, that um, people seem to think that anti-during... I had read that if you only had one book to take to a desert island to for Marxism, mm -hmm. uh, take that book because anti during summarizes Marx's works and work in capital and and what he was doing and all the major things that uh, that Engels was up to and it's a good one summary book. I met a person in an elevator once who saw me carrying that and was very upset with me. He was a Russian immigre over here after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Mm. And he knew we had to read all of that in high school. Everybody in high school had to read that in the Soviet Union. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> maybe its influence wasn't as widespread as I thought if everybody read it and they got rid of the Soviet Union. But, <laughs> but I said, well, I'm going to read it and go through it myself until I get re really familiar with it so that uh, I will have like one book that has has like the outline of the whole system in it. So, and to make myself understand it, I decided I would just sit down and read it and make commentary on it and what I thought was important. And, and I read it from the point of view of today rather than hundred years ago and see what's still living in this and you know, what, what should be changed. Um, and I felt that's how, that's how the books were chosen hmm. on Lenin, because unfortunately, in many of the Marxist Leninist organizations, or at least one that I know of, um, the classical and Orthodox theories are being dismissed for updating Marxism, 21st century Marxism and, uh, which I believe is sort of a mixture of, of, of Bernstein and Eurocommunism masquerading of Marxism-Leninism. So I decided I'm going to read State and Revolution over again and make the same deal, think about it, that I had done with, uh, with Engels. And then, of course, um, all the revisionists, in whatever party you happen to be in in the world, that it happens to have a revisionist tendency to it, likes to use um, in the infantile disorder book, 
left-wing communism and infantilist order to justify uh, the, the revisionist changes they make by saying that, well, Lenin was getting on these people because they didn't want to support uh, political parties and they didn't want to work with the bourgeoisie in certain instances. And so anybody that disagrees with this type of, uh, which they think is Leninism, I think is reformism, they can label as ultra leftists or infant. And this was the book that was most pushed by the web leadership in the Communist Party. If you know the history of the Communist Party, after the death of Gus Hall, the, the chairperson became Sam Webb, who was a liquidationist. Mm. He had two terms of office. He, fi he finally left the, the Communist Party, and, and he works now with the Democrats or supports, mm. supports the Democrats. He's sort of a Clinton Democrat. Jesus. How he got to be chair of the Communist Party was, is a tale of its own that some someday somebody should tell. <laughs> yeah, well, interesting. So, yeah, just for people out there, the, the text really covers four major works, anti during by Engels, and then the other three are by Lenin, Materialism and Imperial Criticism, State and Revolution, and Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder. We'll get into those as this conversation goes on. Um, but in the preface of your text, written, I think, by the, the comrades over at Midwestern Marx, academic Marxism is particularly mentioned. And it is argued that academics have taken figures like Rosa Luxemburg or Gramsci and Marx, denuded them of their revolutionary essence and sort of reduced them to an academic niche. Um, Engels and Lenin, it goes on to assert, have been, quote unquote, indigestible figures for academics and are usually ignored or maligned as corruptors of a pure Marxism. So can you kind of talk about how academia operates in this way, why Engels and Lenin in particular are demonized and sort of what its impact on Marxism has been? Well, I can give my opinion. Sure. It, it, it's true. The uh, preface was written by people who specialized in academic Marxism, which I didn't mm -hmm. specialize in academic Marxism. But I can see that academics, at least in the Western world, especially in the United States, they have to you know, if they're in philosophy or history or sociology departments, they want to get tenure. They're interested in Marxism. Uh, but certainly Lenin, Marx and Engels taken the way the Soviets take them, which was pretty orthodox way, um, is contradictory to the American narrative of what the world should be like which is type of a capitalist system where there's free enterprise and it makes wealth for everybody and the working class and the capitalists collaborate. And uh, of course, there's struggles between them over wages and stuff like that. But nevertheless, the, the, the democracy that we live in allows everybody to, to peacefully live you know, their lives and, and to prosper, even though some people prosper more than others. Uh, and that the Soviet Union and what it represents, what Eastern Europe, what the communist movement represents as a threat to uh, to our society and to freedom and liberty and all of this. And so n professors and graduate students wanting to uh, study Marxism are not going to uh, consider Lenin and and uh, or his successor, whose name we shall not mention. <laughs> Uh, as particularly <laughs> people that they want to be associated with while they're trying to get the tenure. Mm. And using Marx, the, everyone recognizes, I mean, when you study sociology, they, they recognize, yes, there's something, Marx did have something to say about this ideology and about the influence of the economy on people and how culture operates. And, and we can take that as good, social science that he has done made great great contributions like Weber has done and like uh, uh, Mannheim and uh, other great thinkers have done. We don't have to like make him into some type of idol that the communists have made him into and uh, and worship him like they do. Like he can make no mistakes and and you know you go to jail if you disagree with him. So your academic career, you can be an academic Marxist and go succeed in, in the 
universities in some universities, you can't do it so much in Southern universities, as I found out, but you can do it up in New York and boy, there are real big universities. Uh, as long as you don't, you know, wear a hammer and sickle <laughs> on your lapel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing. You talked about um, having anti-during in an elevator and having uh, somebody call that out. I, I actually have a tattoo of a of the hammer and sickle up on my on my shoulder, and I'm, I'm in a volleyball league. And I had a, a woman from um, I think a Kazakhstan actually. Um, I, I saw the way that she was looking at me throughout the whole game, and I was like, I wonder which direction this is going to go. <laughs> and then after the game, sure enough, she comes up to me and she's like, Why Why do you have that? And I just kind of give her my little spiel, and we, we kind of go back and forth. She's very nice, and, and you could tell she doesn't really agree with me, but she just says, well, you, you don't support the current war, right? Uh, you know, you're not, you're not in support of, like, Russia, what it's doing to Ukraine in this moment, are you? And I, I just wanted the conversation to end because I knew it wasn't going to go anywhere um, nice. And so I was like, of course, you know, I'm for peace, and I really am. I want the, I want the bloodshed to stop. That, that's my position, and that's the position of this show. Um, the, the slaughter of people needs to, needs to stop. Um, but it's just kind of interesting that, that those symbols and even that book that you had um, can, can draw the attention uh, and the ire of people like that and you find yourself in an awkward social situation. Um, but yeah, I, I, your points about academic Marxism in particular are really, really important. People do make a career out of it, but you, you really got to lop off the revolutionary part or stay away from these quote-unquote scary figures, particularly Lenin. Um, so, yes, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that in my younger days. Though, if I had a visible tattoo of a hammer and sickle, I might have attracted women. <laughs> well, it's worked for me, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, let's go. Let's go ahead and, and move on. Um, in, in my experience, uh, core concepts like dialectical materialism and historical materialism can be difficult to understand or grapple with for even relatively seasoned Marxists and doubly difficult to apply in one's real-world analysis. So before we move on to, to the text proper, seeing your, your background as a, as a Marxist philosopher of sorts, how would you kind of explain these, these two concepts in as simple a way as possible and why they're essential to Marxism and Marxist analysis? Well, dialectical materialism is just the name that is used to describe the philosophical system of uh, Marxism, of, of orthodox Marxism. It, it comprises the uh, materialism, the fact that the, I uh, hate to use these terms, but we're stuck with them as philosophers, the epistemological and ontological uh, ideas. Ontology is... Uh, is a is the science of being how, what makes the world work and what it's made out of, mm -hmm. and we are materialists. We don't believe that there's any spiritual dimension uh, that precedes the just the atoms and the whatever the physicists are telling us. <laughs> it's the basis of the Big Bang, which is some type of little infinite in point that went boom. Not not a real bang, but you know, just suddenly. Uh, the quantum mechanics people tell us that this thing just expanded and it's all made up of, of photons and electrons and positrons and some other stuff. And that's the basis of all the material stuff in the universe. And it took billions of years. And finally, we got the sun and the earth and the earth cooled down. And then there was water on the earth and sunlight and some little slimy globs started to <laughs> breathe and live. And we all came from that. Mm -hmm. And that's it. No, you know, big guy up in the sky saying, hmm, I'm bored up here. I think I'll create the earth. Uh, <laughs> so that's how we, uh, that's the materialism part. The di dialectical part is that there are two ways of looking at truth that has in the Western tradition, at any rate, you, you think of something as real and true if it's like unchanging. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or you can think, uh, the, for instance, we thought species were unchanging because they did created by God. There were always lions and they didn't change into something else. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't some other little furry animal that turned into lions and, and your pussy cat was related to the lion. Oh, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so dialectics is simply the idea that there's world is in flux. And there are things, we call them contradictions, but they're op opposite things that happen. 
Uh, and the, it's the mixture of these opposite things that uh, bring about change. And that's how we explain matter in motion is uh, the motion is the dialectical part. Uh, the matter is the basis. The motion is opposites. And it's very hard to, to explain it without actually going over some of these texts. But that generally this fluxy world that we live in, uh, we just say that philosophy of dialectical materialism is how we try to approach the world. <clears throat> Historical materialism is that we believe, that is the orthodox Marxist position, is that out of a material world in which life evolved and then consciousness evolved in life and you have different levels of consciousness if you have a dog or a cat you realize that they're they have their little plans too and uh, human consciousness uh an interaction has resulted in different bands of people coming into contact and history uh begins to develop out of nature and so historical materialism is using this dialectical method to look at social events uh, in the human world. And the, di and the other part of dialectic materialism is using the, the dialectics for the natural, natural world. We, for some reason, we said dialectical materialism and historical materialism rather than dialectical naturalism or natural dialectics and historical dialectics, but that's just how it turned out. I see. Yeah, so just to sum it up and, and kind of put it in my own words, uh, dialectical materialism is like the sort of philosophical basis of Marxism. The dialectical aspect um, sees the world as in constant flux, as everything as, is as a f process instead of a static object. The unity of opposites or the coincidence of opposites and the whole flux is driven forward um, by contradiction. And so nothing is static. There's nothing metaphysical. There's no, um, you know, unchanging aspect within things. Everything is a process of flux. The materialism, as you said, is the realization that ontologically, when we look around at the universe, um, even I mean, we start from the from the basis that the the natural material world is the thing that we can seek to understand, and we do not reference any supernatural being or anything outside of the material cosmos as a first cause or as above and beyond material. Um, even if that does exist, we can't know it, at least at this stage in our human history. And then historical materialism is more or less dialectical materialism applied to the evolution of societies, of human societies uh, over time. Um, such that you can kind of think of it in a simplified way as dialectical materialism being like the sort of philosophy of Marxism and historical materialism being the sort of scientific analysis that comes with Marxism. Is that more or less um, fair and in line with what you're saying? Much better stated. <laughs> I think you did a wonderful job of, of saying it, but yes, we, we agree. So I, I, I appreciate that because people do struggle with these things and we always try to clarify um, because they're so essential. We try to clarify these, these ideas as much as we can. So I, I appreciate that. But let's go ahead and finally get into to your book, um, Reading the Classical Texts of Marxism. Now, we, we can't possibly cover all the chapters and intricacies of this almost 500-page work in this interview. So let's just touch on the text your book covers and focus on important elements of those works. And the first one is on Anti-During by Frederick Engels. Why did Engels write Anti-During, and what would you say are some of its most important features or contributions to Marxism? Okay, well, around the uh, time of the 1850s and 60s, like broadly speaking, the Marxism had uh, was being the uh, teaching. Workers were learning about Marxism. They had founded, beginning the parties that began to be uh, founded with uh, Marxist ideas in it, along with other ideas. And the, the most prominent uh, spokesman for socialism uh, was Marx and, and his works and Engels' works. Uh, Ugen During uh, was a philosophy professor, and he uh, joined into the socialist movement, and he began to write books 
in which he criticized Marx and Engels, and he had his own theory of how uh, socialism should develop. And he was beginning to get quite a following, and the followers of Marx and Engels uh, asked Engels if he would write a book or do something to um, refute this uh, Durings positions. He was very busy and didn't want to do that. And uh, it took several years of people, and Marx even maybe may have given some little pressure too. Uh, he finally decided to do that, that he would uh, write this book called Anti-During, but it's an analysis of Ugin During's philosophy uh, and to show how superficial it was. And it was very superficial and silly. As if you read uh, the book, you'll, if you read Engels, you'll see that his arguments against uh, During are, are pretty telling. Um, he set aside... He made this a major work. He set aside several years in which he says he went and studied thoroughly uh, up to the knowledge of his day, you know, got all the science books from the bookstore to, to make sure he didn't say things, you know, he didn't, he wouldn't be caught up not knowing uh, anything about chemistry or physics. Uh, prepared himself and then he, he wrote this book to eliminate the influence of During in the socialist movement. And it was pretty effective because uh, during left the socialist movement later on, if, if you if you read what happened to him, he actually became an anti-Semite. He lived till 1921, and uh, which is interesting when you consider the dates here. Um, Engels died in 95, 1895, Marx in 1883, and this professor during went on and on and on into uh, 1921. He died just a couple of years before Lenin did. Yeah, uh, so if he had have been a good Marxist, <laughs> he, <hadn't, laughs> he would have he would have seen the whole development of uh, practically from the beginning to uh, to the establishment of the Soviet Union. He died one year before the establishment of the Soviet Union. Wow. That's why he wrote the book at any rate. And, and the purpose of the book was to provide for the members of these new, the working class who are joining, becoming socialists and joining like the German party or, or the French parties and stuff, to have in one book an outline of all the major positions that we call dialectical materialism now. They had... Marx wrote a chapter in there on economics where they condensed the first volume of capital down there. Oh, this, is, this is what you need to know. <laughs> uh, then he had uh, books. On, he wrote about science. He wrote about uh, almost everything you can think of. Uh, if you look at the table of contents of that book, I got, let me look here. I have the table of contents and you'll see the, the, uh, the philosophy that he wrote about is is the type of philosophy that Lenin is going to write about in materialism, imperial criticism. But here he, he talks about the philosophy. This, these are uh, contents, chapters from anti-during. The philosophy of nature, uh, the law, morality, and equality. He has a whole book later on on the, on the state and stuff like that. Uh, freedom and necessity. And then on dialectics, he's got chapters on dialectics, on negation, on negation, quantity, quality. He has uh, chapters on political economy. And, and then he has, of course, the criticism of during. Okay, he has a force theory of during. He has a chapter on the theory of values, on labor, uh, on uh, and Karl Marx, Karl Marx's chapter on... Um, political economy in there, and he has a history of the development of socialism and uh, the family, the origin of the family and education and a chapter on SEX, mm. which uh, would have been a better cover of this book, I think, and sold more copies. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if we had a, a comrade on there that represented that. Yeah. Absolutely. I do wonder, specifically given the, the deep scientific aspects of, of anti-During, 
Um, I always talk about uh, Engels and Marx coming across uh, the Darwinian theory of evolution, right? They're more or less contemporaries with Charles Darwin. This breakthrough theory comes out of, uh, you know, the evolution of organisms through time, driven on by contradictions between themselves and their environment. And you could just see how, uh, you know, Engels and Marx getting this from biology would be just all the light bulbs going off. Like this is perfectly in line with our conceptions of what would later be understood as historical and dialectical materialism. No need for um, a supernatural force guiding the evolution of these species. They are material in that sense. They operate as organisms in a deep, profound relationship with their environment and are constantly changing and evolving, always in a state of, 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 pro- of process, um, of development. And so I, I and, and of course Marx wrote to to Charles Darwin saying how much he he loved the book and Charles Darwin uh, responded although his historians believe Darwin didn't actually read anything by Marx but was kind of just being complimentary back towards Marx um, but but uh, Darwinian evolution in particular was just so in line I think with with Engels and Marx's conception of of dialectics and historical materialism. Yes, there's no chapter specifically on Darwin in anti-during but uh is it in the index of the book <laughs> there are nine references to darwin mm. so he was he was not ignored when darwin came out marx and engels you're perfectly correct they they went uh like i want to say they were like crazy fans of darwin the groupies <laughs> <laughs> They really loved Darwin. They thought, wow, this is what they were thinking about, sort of independently popping out here in science in, in Darwin. Mm-hmm. But there's another guy, too, that uh, for the, that's Darwin for nature. And then there's Morgan over here in the United States for historical materialism. Uh, he studied the Iroquois Indians, and then he wrote a great a uh, book on ancient society and the ev- evolution of the of what he called the the clan system, the gens, uh, the stages of savagery. We don't like these terms anymore. Savagery, barbarism, and and civilization, which Marx and Engels thought was wow. He, this guy has also independently discovered historical materialism, mm. and that's the basis of uh, Engels' book on uh, the origin of private property in the state, which is really one of the books I wanted to also go through and have included in this yeah. classical text Marxism, but you can't do everything. That's true. Yeah. And uh, we have a, another sister podcast called Red Menace where we tackle um, texts by, uh, you know, Marxist thinkers. And we're actually in January going to start on Engels' uh, text of the origin of, of private property and the family. So people can stick around and uh, check us out on Red Menace if you want to get deeper into that text in particular. But let's go ahead and move on. And, and next is Lenin's philosophical tome, Materialism and Imperial Criticism. Why did Lenin write this text, and what were its major contributions to Marxist theory, in your opinion? So he is, uh, they're building the revolutionary movement in Russia. This is before the revolution, in 1908 or something like that, around that era. Uh, they've had the... 05 revolution, which failed against the czar, but they're building up the party. And Lenin is an orthodox Marxist. And many of the intellectuals that are joining the Communist Party um, are not clued in to what type of philosophy they're supposed to be doing, as uh, as opposed to just a political analysis of getting the working class and overthrowing the czar. And they are adopting as their political, uh, as their philosophy of nature uh, bourgeois philosophies Lenin Lenin said they are bourgeois philosophy. They're professors like people like mock and uh, other other thinkers religious thinkers and they're spoiling the idea of what Marxism is supposed to be according to Lenin they're letting in uh, idealistic uh, premises from idealistic thinkers thinkers who are influenced by the classical German philosophers or the British philosophers who are idealists, uh, and they are not strictly being materialists. And so he's thinking that this uh, trend to bring in idealism and agnosticism into 
into our movement uh, will, will weaken the movement, that we have to have a consistent philosophy that everybody can agree upon, a materialist philosophy. We have to leave God out of it and religion out of it and the ideas out, the ideas out of it that things only exist because human beings can see them or, or if it wasn't for consciousness, there wouldn't be an external world and that spirit is primary and matter is secondary, that all this is just bunk, according to uh, Lenin. So he wrote this book to justify the materialist philosophy that Marx and Engels had developed uh, before him. And he does it through criticizing uh, Mach, who is a very famous physicist. We still He's still a studied in physics department, we have uh, the speed, the speed the airplanes go, like Mach 7 is supposed to be seven times the speed of sound or something. Mm-hmm. So you, Mach's name is still around in physics. But uh, his philosophy that uh, things have to be perceived and it's our perception of them that brings the reality about that sort of stuff was too religious or had religious, even though Mach may not have been a religious, he and uh, uh, Lenin thought that leaves the basis for religious people to always bring in the possibility of uh, spiritual answers. When physics or science doesn't have an answer for something, uh, then that's that God gets the job. That's what he's called in as the handyman to, uh, <laughs> to fill in your philosophy where there are gaps in it that science can't give you a materialist answer. And he wanted to eliminate that and uh he he talks about as i say not only mock but avenarius we don't know much about us and i mean we know a lot about him but he's not a, have any influence anymore mock is still around influencing but that's physics and uh it's a criticism of dialectical materialism was being taken by some of the leaders of the bolshevik movement they were saying in this time of Lenin that Engels uh, had written, well, they didn't know about that book, so I won't bring that one up, but they were saying that Engels really went beyond what Marx did, and Marx wasn't as materialistic as uh, Engels was. Marx really was concentrating on social problems, on economics uh, and politics, and that Angles applying this to physics and chemistry and nature and all this other stuff, that was something Angles was doing on his own. Uh, af- and then even more after Marx passed away or died, uh, Engels uh, was engaged in this uh, dialectics of nature. At least he hadn't, the book wasn't published in his lifetime, <clears throat> but people knew about it. He'd written essays, some, some little essays here and there had popped up maybe. Mm-hmm. And so, Lenin wanted to have Marx and Engels sort of together, that there was no gap between them, no shadow area between them, that they were together. They both agreed on this. This was a joint philosophy. Marx always said this is a joint philosophy that Engels and I worked on. And Marx credited Engels with giving him ideas and helping him. And yeah, I I also believe uh, with regards to your last point about uh, Lenin trying to show how Engels and Marx were a sort of unified whole is a lot of people um, that want to return to Marx or there's a pure Marxism that was distorted later by figures like Engels and Lenin and then Stalin. Um, they, they make great use of this idea that there's a sort of Marx separate from Engels when that just does not bear out philosophically or historically. Um, but let's go ahead and move on to the next text. And I want to just remind my audience that Although we are taking this, you know, text by text, every single text in this book has a dozen or more um, individual essays on that text. So if you're interested in any of this, highly recommend going out and getting the text, which is, again, called Reading the Classical Text of Marxism, and I will link to that in the show notes. But next up is the highly readable, relatively short, and essential text by Lenin, State and Revolution. What elements of this text do you think are undervalued, and what can we as Marxists learn about the nature of the state from this text? 
Well, I think the important part of state and revolution is, and uh, Marx is, <laughs> Lenin is pointing out what the real relationship is between the working class and the capitalist class. And it is not one of working together cooperatively and sharing the goodies between the two classes based on uh, some idea of justice and fairness uh, uh, that the law provides for them. That he, based on the fact that the manifesto has established that hit, all hitherto existing history is a history of class struggle, there's a class struggle going on between the working class and the bourgeoisie that is the capitalist, the people who own the means of production and distribution and the people who work for them and create the surplus value. I mean, this requires people to understand the Marxist economy and the capital. Um, what is the state then? The state is, has been interpreted by the bourgeoisie, at least by their philosophers, as some type of referee above the, the class struggle. It has a bureaucracy that works for the government and the government tries to balance the needs of the capitalists and the needs of the workers to see that neither one gets uh, unfairly treated by the other. And, and this keeps, uh, this is a bourgeois democracy that uh, allows for this to happen by electing representatives, et cetera, et cetera. And state and revolution, Lenin wants to point out that the, the government, the state is actually controlled by the ruling class and the ruling of whatever ruling class it is, whether it's the Roman patricians that own the land and territory and farms, whether it's the feudal lords, and now it's the capitalists that, that own the, the banks and the uh, factories and whatever, means of production and distribution, the merchants, that these are the people, they are the ones that have the majority of the wealth that is produced it goes to their group and is redistributed down to the workers as only as like the minimum they need to get by. And if you're lucky and you live in a country that can get some colonial money in there, they can give the workers a little more to make them happy and support what, they, what their government does. And therefore, to get socialism, you have to destroy the present state which is basically a state of the capitalists. He uses a term like it's the board of directors of the capitalist class. That's what the state is. And you have to replace it with a state that represents the working class. This will be a different state. He doesn't think you can reform the capitalist state and change it into a, uh, a working class state. There, there are, there's some evidence that there are some statements here and there that people have made, including Marx and Engels and maybe Lenin once or twice too, that seem to not necessarily preclude that 100%, that it could be possible for, uh, Engels thinks at the end of his life, he, he thought the German socialist was so powerful that it might be possible for them to take over the state and uh, then dismantle uh, the parts they don't like and, and have a socialist state. But in general, the idea was that it, the state would have to be replaced by a term they used uh, called the dictatorship of the proletariat, which causes all sorts of problems <laughs> with people today. Uh, <clears throat> for instance, there, there are people in, in my party that say, oh, we can't have a dictatorship. Nobody wants to have a dictatorship. Dictatorship is, that's a dumb idea. <clears throat> Using the term, taking the term out of the historical context and applying it incorrectly to every type of government in which there is extreme power. The dictatorship of the proletariat, Engels says that we have, you already live in a dictatorship and it's a, the dictatorship of the capitalist class. Mm -hmm. So you're going to replace the dictatorship of the capitalist class with the dictatorship of the proletariat. And that doesn't mean Hitler. It doesn't mean P 
Putin, although Putin is nothing like Hitler. Agreed. Uh, uh, but it's a, a strong man type thing. Mm -hmm. It's um, a, simply means that the working class will have all the political power in its hands. And the capitalist class that used to dictate everything will be subservient and gradually as the dictatorship of the proletariat progresses and takes over and learns how to manage the economy and nationalizes the um, means of production and distribution, the capitalist class will disappear. And when the cat will disappear peacefully, retire them to Miami or someplace, they <laughs> and they can, uh, they will not have power anymore. And then the state itself, since the state is by definition, a tool of one class to oppress another. Once you have gotten rid of the oppressor class and you, the, everybody is now in the working class, as it were, uh, you won't need a state per se. The state itself will gradually disappear and its functions will be all local. So you'll have like local communes and people will get together and it'll be hunky dory land. Mm -hmm. That's the, um, the theory for state and revolution. And the basic premise there is still correct that the, the state we live in is a state of the ruling class. And that applies here to the United States. So it's a book that Americans should read who have the illusion that one of the two political parties here is somehow the friend and buddy of the working class. Mm -hmm. And you can read some paper, some newspapers published by people claiming to be Marxist Leninists have headlines like Biden has our backs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a that's a working class newspaper saying that you say, hmm, I don't know what's going on here. <clears throat> These people haven't read State and Revolution. Um, so it's it's one of the books that the um, revisionists of all sorts want to say, well, that's outdated. It's, you know, forget that one. Right. So I thought that's one we should I put that in here. That is, I wrote on that one because I thought it's very important to have that as a counterbalance to the misinterpretation of uh, infantile, uh, the infantile disorder books. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's one of those texts that, that I would recommend to any sort of, you know, person that's just becoming interested in Marxism and wants to read Marxist theory. Once you really understand this theory of the state, a lot of other things can make sense. Um, and, and this whole idea as well of um, of dictatorship is just this idea that the nature of the, the nation state is, as you said so well, um, a class rule. And so it's just a, it's not a question of dictatorship or not dictatorship. It's, it's a question of as long as the state exists, what class controls it? And in a, in a country like the United States, it is a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, of the owning class. And there's also this idea that well, eventually the state will wither away and some people treat this as uh, silly or naive or even utopian. But really what Lenin is saying is once the class divisions – you know, are are transcended once we live in a society in which human beings are no longer divided up into different classes, some that own and some that have to sell their labor, then the very basis of the state, which again is class rule, disappears. And so you would be left with something like you can call it an administrative state or or whatever you want to call it, but the nation state as we've come to understand it would no longer have the premise, the foundation upon which it currently exists. That is dividing society into classes and having one of those classes dominate the other. Um, and so I, I think that's very crucial. And I would just ask you one more question because I think this there's a lot of confusion about this. And I'll even hear people use Lenin, state and revolution against China. And I, I think it's kind of uh, amusing when they try to do this. But in your opinion, at least, what does Lenin's analysis of the state tell us about, let's say, modern China and its Communist Party? Well... This has to do with the theory, original theory that Marx and Engels had, that the socialist revolution would come about in the most developed capitalist states, that when capitalism had shot its wad and had nothing more to give, 
it would break down and that would cause the uh, markets wouldn't work properly because they saturated the markets and the working class would have to take over the means of production and distribution just to keep them going. And they would have to give up the idea that you have to expand, expand, expand and make profit, profit, profit all the time. And you would use this big economic facility that the bourgeoisie had created uh, for need and use value rather than exchange value. And that would be the basis of socialism. And therefore it wouldn't happen, happen in some feudal area, okay? And where did the Chinese revolution, this is very simplified here, where did the Chinese revolution take place? It took place in a country that was like 90%, 80, 90% peasants out in the countryside, illiterate peasants at that. And the communist party that formed there um, was basically a peasant party, but it had a proletarian, the working class was very teeny. It was in the cities and it, it really got smashed by the by the anti-communist Chiang Kai-shek back in the 20s. And uh, so they found themselves in charge of this great big country <laughs> with, with a very small working class and a very poor economy. And it, where, how are you going to, um, are you going to skip stages? Can you skip the capitalist stage and go directly from peasant hut to modern air-conditioned apartment. And people had thought about maybe that could happen in Russia because the Russian peasants and serfs had some communal system that was going on that they said, oh, that's, you know, maybe we could use that as a basis. And then it, <clears throat> they turned out that they didn't, they didn't go that way. Uh, so what has happened in China is this, the state has been taken over by and is run by a communist party that's basically trying to build a Marxist-Leninist type of state, the socialist state, and they don't have the economic background to do that. So they have had to make what the Italians, it's, a, it's an Italian term, the Italians, it's not how the Italians did it though, mm -hmm. but it's a historical compromise. And that is, you know what, we're gonna have to uh, build up this economy and we live, the world is capitalist. And so we're gonna have to deal with markets if we're gonna sell products and buy food and export our rice or whatever and build up ourselves. So we're gonna have to have some capitalism going on here, but it's going to be directed by the state. It's not gonna be a state in which the capitalists tell us what to do, mm -hmm. which happens in other in capitalist countries the capitalists tell the politicians what to do it's going to be a state where the politicians that is the marxists are going to tell the capitalists what to do mm -hmm. we're going to keep them on a you know a leash mm -hmm. and as as we develop and become more and more industrialized and our economy we will use this machinery to raise people out of poverty to start to introduce this, the, these type of socialist reforms that will uh, lead eventually to this capitalist sector of our state. It's not a capitalist state because the big private industries, the commanding heights are still under control of the party. Mm -hmm. But these big capitalist firms will gradually be reined in and will gradually put communist people in there and they will be integrated together into uh, in, into uh, the type of socialism that we believe is possible. They talk about a hundred years from now. Good, I'm glad they have a nice cushion because we're not going to see it right away. <laughs> it's uh, there's nothing that they're doing that look that is contradictory to that. Mm -hmm. So in in fact the. Uh, this new leadership that Xi Jinping has brought in, the problem that with capitalism in China is that the, the, the Deng Xiaoping reforms, his successors were going more and more right-wing and more and more uh, away from socialism and towards free market economy. Uh, and if they had been left without being reined in, that is if the communist party uh, 
intellects in the in the inner core that we don't hear about hadn't said, look, look, we're getting out of hand here. We have to get back on the right road. And this is where Jing Xiaoping came in into the leadership was to put a halt to these the power that the capitalists had because they could see throughout China, the whole world was talking about corruption, how people, Chinese, local Chinese officials were abusing peasants, were, were building houses, were taking state money. It was really getting out of control. And GC, uh, Xi Jinping has stopped that and reversed that, and it's putting China back on the road of what Mao should have been doing if he hadn't gone a little you know, crazy in his old age. Yeah. <laughs> uh, should have should have been doing is is a planned economy. They they don't call them five year plans, but they they have a planned economy where they're going step by step uh, towards eliminating poverty and trying to make what they say a moderately wealthy country, considering the billion two hundred million people there by 2050. And that's a big step forward. It's a transitional period. It's something that Marx and Engels didn't write about. Uh, a little bit of this was done by Lenin called the um, New Economic Plan in Russia. Yeah. When he, he realized, you know, we got to call the capitalists back here you know, and get them in there. To, we don't know how to manage these factories and get them going and stuff. But they too were under state control. After Lenin's death, Stalin put an end to that and started the started the five year plans. Uh, and he built he industrialized Russia. Mm -hmm. um, some it was at great cost. But uh, if he hadn't done it, he probably wouldn't have been able to keep Hitler out when Hitler came in. Exactly. exactly. But the cost, it's one of those. It was it was a great cost. So if you're going to built i can only think fidel gave good advice i remember back in the 70s fidel gave advice to the working revolutionary groups in south america and latin america he said don't try and become what we are do not try to introduce socialist states <laughs> when you come to power because if you knew the problems we had trying to skip stages here. They had this, there was a Soviet Union that kept them afloat. The Soviet Union would collapse. Then they would, they had the special period in the nineties. Now they're back in economic problems again. He, he said, we're not ready for it. So I don't recommend that you try to just go right in there and take over the government right and think you're gonna build socialism. The places that tried to do that, Ethiopia failed in doing that. All these other backward places, the Nepalese are fighting with each other. It, it's um, it's it's very complicated. And if you can just go build up your economy, the real problem is as long as the United States is around with with the number one big super power capitalist country, um, it's going to be very difficult for any new country to actually come in and become a a socialist country. And not only has the United States stuck, Cuba is the last one that uh, actually proclaimed socialism. I mean, the, the Vietnamese were already socialists. They just took over the South, but they had proclaimed socialism before that. I think Cuba is the last one that, to build socialism. The United States has prevented anybody else from going down that road, uh, except the Vietnamese who defeated them. Uh, but they already had socialism before Cuba. They had it from the 45 on with Ho Chi Minh. And they, act, they succeeded in overthrowing the Soviet Union and the Eastern European communist world, socialist world. So, there's, so they couldn't have had socialism. It's, if, our, if our theory is you go from slavery to feudalism to capitalism to socialism, we don't have a regression where you go back. No capitalist country has gone back to feudalism. No feudal country has gone back to socialism. So I don't know what the Soviet Union had. They did do in a sort of macabre way. They did proclaim socialism. Stalin said we had the socialist constitution. 
Khrushchev said we have a state of the whole people. So they, they had a state of the whole people. They eliminated the capitalists, and then they did what they were supposed to do. They withered away, mm. but they were replaced by Putin. Mm -hmm. That's not what was the that's not what was in the book. <laughs> <What a replacement. laughs> right. Actually, they were replaced by Yeltsin. Putin is a, a, actually a progressive compared to Yeltsin. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I, I really appreciate that that breakdown of a very complicated history and theory. But I, I'm of the same opinion that there's nothing that China is doing that is anathema to Leninism. In fact, it fits right in line. And you could say I, I really do believe that Xi is a committed Marxist. And I think he's he very carefully and meticulously has learned from the failures of previous attempts. And they are doing a more long range experimental approach uh, to building socialism. The, the way that I put it is that China has a communist political party overseeing the development of the forces of production. It does have currently a capitalist mode of production and capitalist social relations, but capital, as you said, is subservient to the state. And the general idea is that once China is militarily and economically strong enough to not be devoured by imperialist wolves or cut off from the rest of the global economy and isolated as Cuba has been, that it can make a proper transition towards socialism, i.e. revolutionizing the forces and relations of production. Um, now, if they never, ever do that, if they never make that move, you know, then, then perhaps you could say that the anti-China left will have been vindicated. But if they do make that move, they will be the most advanced socialist society in human history. And all the anti-China leftists will have basically cut themselves off from that profound achievement and have functionally joined sides with the liberals and the imperialists and the fascists launching slander and hate at the Chinese people and their revolution. Um, and so, you know, you can you can perhaps maintain some sort of agnosticism saying like, well, right now there's the capitalist mode of production. There's capitalist social relations. We shall see um, where they go from here. But the basic idea that they're that they're a communist party in charge of the entire society, developing the forces of production, overseeing the development of capitalism. And then once the, t the time is ripe, particularly when China is economically and militarily powerful enough um, at, at the very least to defend itself from from a rabid dog like the United States, that they can ma make a more proper transition. Um, but one of the beautiful things that I think China has done, um, whether fully consciously or not, but this has been the case, is unlike other you know socialist uh, experiments in the past, they've thoroughly embedded their economy into the global economy such that it's essential for the functioning of the entire global economy. And, um, and and that is really a quite profound achievement and is different in some ways than the Soviet Union, which had this sort of, you know, these blocks. You're split. The global economy is split into these, these two blocks. China has done something different, that China has embedded its economy in the entire capitalist global economy such that it is essential. It's an essential Jenga block, <laughs> if you will. And um, I think that puts them in a, in a very unique pers um, position. And uh, the last thing I'll say is that I do think that Xi sees himself as carrying on this, the, the, the revolutionary uh, momentum of, of Mao. He sees Mao as having, you know, let the, the Chinese people stand on their own after the century of humiliation, start the revolution and win the civil war and kick out the Japanese imperialists, setting the stage for a more robust development. Then Deng Xiaoping comes in. Um, there's economic reforms. The economy over the over this several decades is built up to the largest economy in the world, absolutely essential for the functioning of the global economy. And now I think Xi sees himself as having to develop the Chinese um, into a military and continue to develop it into an economic power to make it more robust um, and, and more able to persevere and fight back against what we know and we already see is the U.S. and its allies attempting at every turn to undermine it, to destroy it, to weaken it, um, and to attack it. And so at the very least, I think it is a new and interesting experiment in the history of socialism. They're doing things in a more long-range plan, and I think it is completely in line with Marxist-Leninist philosophy. Well, do you agree with that, or am I, am I wrong on anything there? No, I agree. the the only The only problem I have with that is Chinese is so difficult to learn. I've, 
taken some courses and it's like, oh, I thought Russian was bad. <laughs> I would love to learn Mandarin, yeah. Well, uh, let's go on and move on and, and let's cover this last text here. I want to be um, you know, respectful of your time here. So just a couple more questions. Uh, the last text that you cover in, in your wonderful book is uh, another classic by Lenin and one you've alluded to throughout this discussion thus far, left-wing communism and infantile disorder. Can you remind us of the sort of historical context in which that text was written and what you think its major contributions to Marxist theory really are? Okay, to make uh, another long, long story short, after the success of the Re Russian Revolution and they were in power, communist parties and people started to form around the world, that is to say, social, the old social par socialist parties that uh, had failed to stop World War I and then the rule was all the socialist parties of which the Russian Socialist Democratic Party was one had said, if World War I breaks out, uh, none of us will support the war and we'll all vote against it if we're in parliament and stuff. And what happened was just the opposite. All the big parties, almost all the big parties, I think the Chilean party didn't do it. Uh, the Russians didn't do it. Uh, the, the Americans didn't do it either for that matter. And there, there are a couple of other parties, but most of the big parties, at least in France and Germany and England, they voted to support their own governments. And this just, this was a, an imperialist war in which the working class of the Germans fought the working class of the French for the benefit of the capitalists of those two class, uh, those two countries. And this was anathema to Lenin. All right, so he had his revolution. The Soviet, the Soviet Union didn't come into existence yet, but the Russian state was there. Uh, they were fighting. They had come to power. And other communist parties, some, not all, some communist parties in, in the Netherlands and England uh, became so pro-Soviet, so pro-Russian, so pro-communist that they would not cooperate with any other forces except their own little group to fight for the revolution. They would not make what we now, they didn't use the term in those days, the term of a united front or, or a popular front, well, or a united front. They was do it alone type of, and they wouldn't work with regular unions, they'd form their own unions. And Lenin said that this, is not the right way to go. You have the, you have to in the real world. You have to make compromises. It's one step forward, two step forward, one step back type of thing. Um, and if you if you try to not work with your local unions, uh, you, you won't be with the working class. I mean, you have to be with the working class to convert. If you're going to lead the working class, you have to go out there and talk to them, be with them, and work with them and gain their confidence. Uh, doesn't mean you should follow them. We had a headline in one of our papers the other day said, follow the working class. <laughs> that, <laughs> no, that is not what we do. I mean, that's not what we're supposed to do. This was like the working class was voting for the Democrats, so we should. Right. Uh, it, it's, uh, you, you, should, you should go where the working class is and uh, gain their confidence, but you want to be a vanguard party uh, of, and... Uh, the Vanguard Party doesn't follow, it leads. But you have to earn that. You have to work with people. Uh, and you have to follow them in the sense that, okay, we're supporting you, but we're telling you this won't work, you know, and we've got plan B. And when they find out their plan A doesn't work, they'll listen to our plan B. This is a theory. And then we will be able to lead them more successfully. So he wrote this book. The infantile disorder is the disorder of brand new communist groups that are forming that ha haven't had this experience that the Russian party went through with the, the 1905 revolution, uh, 20 or 30 years of working with all these different groups. Uh, these are popping up, new groups popping up, and uh, they are full of youth. Yes, he said, we support them. You know, I love these guys doing it. But they, it's really very infantile for them. 
to say that they're not going to work with the if there's no communist movement and it's a labor party guy against a liberal or a conservative guy you support the labor party guy mm -hmm. and uh and and have plan b there for them <laughs> 100 mm -hmm. years later we still got plan b <laughs> but so that's the point and the thing is he said don't to the other communists the other parties who are doing the correct thing don't really get on these people's cases it's an infantile disorder they will learn through their experience that preaching to them and telling them they're ultra leftist or this that or the other thing that's not going to get you anywhere they will learn through their own experiences over the coming years that what i'm telling them is correct that they have to make compromises they have to work with other groups and they and but they have to keep plan b there they shouldn't give it up and they should always mention it to people but not be obstructionists about it uh and they they will be part of the movement they'll they'll join the movement on their own as they learn the way that book is used by people today who are revisionists is they just call another group ultra leftists and they don't even want to have anything to do with them. Oh, we're not going to work with them. We don't work. We don't work with the Green Party. We don't work with this group. Yeah, they're ultra leftists. They don't, you know, they don't vote for the Democrats. That, that shows they're all bigoted. <laughs> and it's um, a, a big misuse because the idea isn't to push people away, but to try to bring them slowly over to your point of view. And you, you don't do that by insulting them and refusing to deal with them. Right. Yeah, and so Lenin calling it an infantile disorder is not Lenin saying that they're babies or that they're, they're they're childish necessarily. He's like their movement is young and so far naive, and through experience they'll come to see that strategy and sometimes compromise. These things are a part of the movement and the way that you develop the movement and these a priori sort of commitments that are outside of any context – these things are not the way that you should orient your movement around. So he's not really name calling as much as he's just saying there's a certain naivete and youth to this movement and through, uh, you know, experience will become more seasoned and will be able to grow up and develop, right? Correctamente. Absolutely. And I just would like to say as well that um, over, I, I mentioned our, our sister podcast, Red Menace, where me and my co-host tackle these texts. We already have episodes on both Lenin's left-wing communism and his state and revolution. So if you'd like to do deep dives into those texts, we walk through the entire text with our listeners. We summarize it, and then we have a discussion and reflection about it. So if anybody's interested in learning more about that text, you can buy this wonderful book, Reading the Classical Text of Marxism, and you can also check out our podcast over at Red Menace where we cover that text in depth. Well, we had you for 90 minutes here, and I'm just going to ask a couple more questions, um, just kind of a concluding set of questions that I'm interested in, um, given your, you know, given your position as a seasoned veteran of Marxism, if you will. So as a veteran of Marxism and Marxist theory, what are your thoughts about this new generation of, of millennial and Gen Z Marxists? And how has have the material and ideological conditions in the U.S. changed since you were coming up? <laughs> Well, I'm not uh, too familiar with these new groups, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to tell you the truth. I'm still a, a Clark Gable guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know these groups don't know what I'm talking about when I say, hey, you, you know Humphrey Bogart, right? You've seen Casablanca. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it seems to me, I don't think in terms of the of generations, but just individuals, Mm -hmm. Young people today have to learn, uh, of course, if they read my book, they will get it right. <laughs> they have to learn, but they have to go out there and, and work with the, if they want to be socialists and they want to get rid of capitalism, they're going to ha have to go out there and work with all sorts of other people. Some that have to, reformists, other Marxists, you, they have people going around being well, hoaxists and, and Maoists and Trotskyists, there are all these different people out there. There's somehow you have to work with them to get a unified movement because right now there are just the right now the left doesn't really exist in the United States. It's more of a okay, we think it's there, but actually the capitalists have the a lockstep. The Democrats and the Republicans run the whole thing. 
And the, the idea that we can change an election, that the left could stop Trump from taking over, is uh, the, the whole left organized Marxist left. Pro, I'm not talking about DSA is not Marxist. <clears throat> They're a big group. There's a little Marxist group in there. But the Marxist Leninists, the people who call themselves communists, uh, they couldn't fill up Yankee Stadium. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they think they could go out there and prevent fascism from taking over and they're going to do that is like, okay. So I don't know how to answer your question. It's um, your generation is going to have to figure out how to work with uh, your own people and with the old and with the powers that be to uh, try and get Marxist Leninist ideas permeated into the working class. The problem is with the union movement. The unions under capitalism, unions are a, a part of capitalism. They're institutions that capitalists use to control the working class. The idea that the, the ruling class is anti-union is crazy. The Republicans want to keep the unions down, but the Democrats, which represent the working, uh, you know, Bezos is a Democrat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, there are billionaires, Democrats out there because they, they're, it's their party. It's a capital, capitalist party. They understand you don't want the working class out there running around with red flags and Lenin posters in their offices. Right. You want them to support your party, one of your capitalist party. And the leaders of the unions, no, there's no, I don't think there's one major union in the United States that says that socialism is on their agenda. Their slogan is a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. They're, they just want more of the pie. They don't tell their workers, listen, we made the whole pie. Why should the capitalists get a slice? Right. They just want, yeah, the capitalists can have, you know, they're taking five tenths the half they're taking half the pie or they're taking 75 percent of the pie why can't they give us another five percent that'll keep us happy for a generation mm. so unless we can get the working people in this country to be interested in marxism or to see marx if they don't feel exploited if they don't if, if they're if they're really being exploited it should show up in their consciousness and right. it's not showing up in their consciousness Right. They vote Democrat. Some of them uh, vote Republican. Some of them are for Trump. Mm -hmm. Not many of them, but there's a there's a significant percentage of uh, maybe 10, 20, 30 percent working people in unions even, although I think they're in AFL rather than CIO unions that uh, support Trump. Uh, if we can't get to those people, then if if the superstructure is supposed to reflect the reality of what's going on in the substructure down there, which is exploitation and and exploitation is going on, but they're, they're working people aren't blaming the proper people mm -hmm. for the exploitation. They're more interested in cultural wars or they're blaming liberals or they're blaming um, people with gender dysphoria or something. For their their problems, it's, um, that's your generation's job. My generation failed. The generation before us failed. But before my generation failed, <laughs> we've been failing a lot. <laughs> yeah. We're still around. It's your turn to go and fail. But I hope you guys make it where we didn't. Hell yeah, absolutely. We and did stop the Vietnam War. Mm. We did. Well, we stopped it. Uh, because the Viet Cong beat the crap out of the army over there, of our army. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but we helped. Right. And, and every generation of socialists have the obligation to advance the ball for our movement, for our class, for our vision of, of humanity's future. And uh, we all do our best to do that. And, of course, the reason, one of the reasons why there's so many, all, are the unions are so conservative in so many ways and so wedded to the two-party system, um, it's it's... Part of that is, you know, the, the the concerted attempt by the by the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie over the last century to dismantle, especially during the the twenties and thirties, the 
um, the early IWW and these radical unions that did identify with socialism and communism, those had to be destroyed. And then with the advent of Reaganism and neoliberal ideology, even just unions in general uh, were decimated. And so there's a lot of work to do on that front. But to su- summarize your points, you know, we got to get out there. We got to organize in the real world. We can't just spend all of our time yelling at each other on social media sites. We have to be able to work with people who don't necessarily already agree with us, whether that takes the form of somebody else on the socialist left of a different tendency or just the regular working class guy that's your neighbor or that works with you as a coworker that might have retrograde views, but you have a shared economic interest. You have to be able to talk to and engage with a wide swath of people, not just isolate yourself into these tiny microsect silos where you all just confirm each other's already existing biases. Um, so I really take that those, um, those lessons to heart, and, and I, I concur completely. So our generation has kicked the can down the road. <laughs> now it's your turn to get that can. It's our turn. Well, I really deeply appreciate you coming on the show to have this fascinating, wide-ranging discussion. Um, I really appreciate all the knowledge you bring to bear on these issues. The book, again, is Reading the Classical Texts of Marxism. I will link to it in the show notes. Um, Thank you so much for coming on. I would love to have another discussion with you sometime in the future. Well, thank you for having me.